So Ukrainians this morning as well woke up to bombs and missiles. Vladimir Putin, remember, announced that he would be starting a military operation in the Donbas region yesterday morning. But immediately after that, minutes after that, there were missiles that started to rain down on Ukrainian cities. Now, Vladimir Putin claims that this military operation is to demilitarize the former Soviet nation. The declaration, of course, came at a time when the world had sat down to try and find a diplomatic solution at the United Nations Security Council. The West has promised that the Russian president will be held accountable for his actions and has now started to implement sanctions that will create some kind of a financial deterrence for Russia to back off. But are these financial sanctions enough? Has the West done enough in terms of making Russia pay? Our next report gets you the details. Putin chose this war and now he and his country will bear the consequences. U.S. President Joe Biden unveiled harsh new sanctions against Russia on Thursday after Moscow launched an all-out invasion of Ukraine, imposing measures to impede Russia's ability to do business in the global economy. We've now sanctioned Russian banks that together hold around $1 trillion in assets. We've cut off Russia's largest bank, a bank that holds more than one-third of Russia's banking assets by itself, cut it off from the U.S. financial system. And today, we're also blocking four more major banks. That means every asset they have in America will be frozen. Biden said the sanctions were designed to have a long-term impact on Russia and to minimize the impact on the United States and its allies. And he said Washington was prepared to do more. This is going to take time, and we have to show resolve so he knows what's coming. And so the people of Russia know what he's brought on them. That's what this is all about. His announcement represented the second major tranche of sanctions against Russia, and Biden warned personally sanctioning Russian President Vladimir Putin was still an option. These powers will enable us. Adding to the latest round of Western penalties, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson unveiled new measures targeting banks, members of Putin's inner circle, and the very wealthy who enjoy high rolling London lifestyles to, quote, maximize the economic price Putin will pay adding Putin will be condemned by history. Now we see him for what he is, a blood-stained aggressor who believes in imperial conquest. What wasn't part of Thursday's tranche of sanctions, cutting off Russia from SWIFT, the interbank messaging network that is the backbone of international finance. The sanctions that we have proposed on all their banks have of equal consequence, maybe more consequence than SWIFT number one. Number two, uh, it is always an option, but right now that's not the position that the rest of uh, Europe wishes to take. Describing Thursday's onslaught as a dangerous moment for Europe, Biden said he authorized troops that have been placed on standby to deploy to Germany to defend NATO allies, stressing that Putin's actions have made him a pariah on the international stage. Putin's aggression against Ukraine will end up costing Russia dearly economically and strategically. We will make sure of that. So what will be the American response and how will, of course, Russia, how has it prepared to deal with these sanctions? Chris McGarrion from Associated Press gets us more details. President Biden came out today at the White House to outline stiff sanctions that he wants to use to punish the Kremlin for the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, these sanctions, he says, have gone farther than anything the United States has done in the past in hopes of showing that Russia's aggression will not be tolerated and uh, will not succeed in the long run. This is not the full force of what the Biden administration has prepared. Uh, some steps like sanctioning Vladimir Putin personally have not been taken at this point. And President Biden basically said that we're going to see how this goes, see what happens next, and maybe roll out more in the future. And what they're arguing is that we have to kind of keep keep pace with Russia's actions as Russia continues more essentially put in place. They don't want to escalate the situation, uh, but they want to try to uh, have a, a, a firm punishment as this war continues. Now, until Wednesday evening, the people of Ukraine were, of course, going about their daily routine as normal, but their lives have turned on their heads in a matter of hours. They were seen running for cover, struggling for survival. According to reports that have now come in, at least 137 people have died in the first day of fighting. Scores of others have been injured and thousands are fleeing the country. The highways are now choked with traffic and there were long queues that were witnessed outside of banks and ATMs. 
Now, the missile strikes by the Russians, of course, continue on Ukraine. So the question, of course, is how has Ukraine prepared for this? Our next report gets you the details. Tanks. Helicopters. <laughs> missiles. <laughs> and troops. All descended upon Ukraine this morning. Civilian apartments were bombed. Military command centers were hit. International flights diverted their routes. And the people of Ukraine were forced to flee. These visuals are from Kyiv, which has been gripped by panic. Terrified citizens are huddling in groups, waiting for the next bus to take them away. Uh, I'm going to my parents. Uh, they are living in the middle of Ukraine, and I think it's safer there. The city's streets are choked with traffic. Everywhere you turn, there's a long line of cars on their way out of the capital. I myself am from Lviv. The mood is patriotic. I will take my children away and return. We will fight this off. Ukraine will win no matter what. Where exactly are these people going? Most of them are headed to stay with their relatives in safer cities. Others are crossing over into Poland, too scared to risk their lives by staying back. Really, we are feeling bad because it was it was um, unexpected, and uh, we all want peace and um, quiet. We don't want uh, war. Please, like stop, because um, people suffer from it, and we uh, we must we must uh, go out of the country because we have like no other choice. But we are students, okay, we have like some uh, obligations to study. Those who have stayed back have taken shelter in their homes. They're sharing videos of Russian bombardments, expressing their disbelief at the turn of events. Kiev is full of smoke. This is the city center. Every five minutes, bomb is dropping by Russian army. On the front line, Ukrainian soldiers are equally startled. One such soldier shared this video, telling his parents how much he loved them. In the city of Kharkiv, many have lined up outside hospitals. They're donating blood to create reserves for exceptional situations. The hospital says at this moment it's not clear how much blood reserves Ukraine might need. We are forming reserves. At the moment we are forming reserves, but whether they'll suffice or not, I can't tell as of now. In the city of Mariupol, the situation is the most devastating. Located right next to Russia's border, it was rocked by explosions throughout the day. Scores of people were injured. One such resident who was injured in an explosion gave a chilling account of the trauma she experienced. I never thought that such a thing could happen. I never thought that this would truly happen in this lifetime. I wrote poems about the war. I myself am a director and educator. We studied the history, but we never thought that this would happen on our land. The house is completely destroyed. There are no windows, no doors, one door even flew out. Even the floor has been completely ripped off. I'm just very lucky. I must have a very strong guardian angel for me to have stayed alive. The situation right now is truly a nightmare for the people of Ukraine. One day they were going about their daily lives, another day they are fighting for survival. What have they done to deserve this? Well, 
too many of them demanded a future that looked to the west and not towards Moscow. And that is their only crime. Vion is now available in your country. Download the app now and get all the news on the move. Russia has about 80% of its forces in forward positions ready to go at the border, and today could be the day. That's the word we are getting now. While well, Latvian officials report Russian forces continue to move into the occupied separatist areas of Ukraine, and at the UN General Assembly, the Ukrainian foreign minister is asking for more Western support, holding out hope that there is still a window of opportunity to deter Russia from an all out war. Joining us now, our uh, all-around top panel with the very latest senior foreign correspondent, Ian Panel. He's on the ground in Ukraine. ABC's Phil Lipoff on the ground in Poland. Also with us, White House correspondent Mary Alice Parks and ABC News' Elizabeth Schulze here with me on the set. Ian, let's start with you. The Ukrainian military seems to have reason to believe that Russia plans to go beyond eastern Ukraine, targeting at least two major cities now as the bell tolls there. What are the implications of that? Yeah, that's right. It's interesting because the public uh, discourse, if you like, has been that they don't expect an invasion to be imminent uh, and to try and keep everybody calm and confident. And you've seen a gradual ramping up, really, I think, of the, the pressure on the Ukrainian government and their response in terms of making the public and the military ready for what could come. So we know um, from two sources who were in the room that there was a briefing last night from the Ukrainian military to President Zelensky and key lawmakers uh, in which they said that they felt that Russia was in a position to perhaps go beyond the east of the country. Uh, it mentioned two specific cities that it could target, and they discussed the idea that they could also target the capital here, uh, Kiev, as well. Uh, and of course, the consequences of that we saw almost immediately. Uh, the president addressing the nation for the second night in a row, uh, essentially ordering this uh, state of emergency. It's not quite a state of uh, war footing, but it's close to that, and also activating part of the the military reserve. 36,000 uh, combat veterans, people with military experience, have now been called up. In fact, we were at the home of one young couple this morning, uh, uh, this evening, sorry. The, the, the father there, he has been called up. He found out early this morning. Tomorrow morning, he's heading out to the army. He doesn't know where in the country he's going to go, and it's time for those, the, you know, for them to say their goodbyes tonight, knowing that they could be facing war this time tomorrow. So they are definitely uh, sensing a shift there on the ground. As you just mentioned, uh, they're well aware of the state of emergency in addition to all the additional assets. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because there is this veneer of calm. It's kind of that image of a duck or a swan where it looks calm on the surface, but underneath there's kind of furious paddling going on. And, and I think that pretty much sums up what's going on here. There is no panic on the streets. You, know, you don't see empty supermarket shells as we see uh, in America and in Europe whenever there's a, a you know, weather system coming through. People are being very mm. calm and they're exuding confidence, but they're all making plans. Uh, this couple that we spoke to this evening have basically, in the last 24 hours, formed a plan A, B and C. Plan A is where they shelter in place. Plan B is getting all the relatives together in a safe location. Plan C is to leave the city altogether. Every single Ukrainian family is now having to have that discussion here in Kiev or in those frontline cities. Nobody can really sit on their hands anymore waiting to see what happens. Everyone's going to have to hope for the best, but they're definitely preparing for the worst. Kira. Yep, and they've been there before, that's for sure. Phil, today, dozens of U.S. lawmakers sent President Biden a letter warning him that he'll need congressional authorization if any U.S. troops are to engage in Ukraine. Biden has made it clear that is not in his plans. You're there in Poland where thousands of U.S. troops are stationed already. Secretary Austin also announcing uh, troops moving into the Balkans yesterday. What can you tell us about all the roles of these various troops and the various missions? Well, first, that letter, Kira, as you know from being in D.C., virtually nothing uh, is bipartisan these days in the United States. But that letter was very bipartisan, so bipartisan, in fact, that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Matt Gates both signed on. But, of course, it's a reminder President Biden doesn't really need because he said on a number of occasions the troops that are over here uh, in this region are not here to fight. So you mentioned the troops to the Balkans. 
uh, additional troops to the Balkans, more, uh, 5,000 troops or so here uh, in Poland. It's important because both places are NATO members, Poland, the Balkans, and both share borders with Russia, something that President Putin has said uh, he doesn't like very much. And obviously, uh, much of this, he says, is over the fact he didn't want Ukraine uh, to join NATO either. So those troops are here in an assist to assist uh, NATO members. They are not here to fight. Uh, here in Poland, they are getting ready with Polish authorities uh, to, to mine the border. Because if President Putin pushes uh, in further out of eastern Ukraine and attacks cities uh, past eastern Ukraine, well, then a lot of Ukrainians will come this way toward the border. And Poland is preparing for a, a potential refugee crisis. Could be tens of thousands. Our Martha Raddatz reported today it could be over a million. Meanwhile, um you're monitoring more countries, more sanctions, uh, Elizabeth, uh, a number of other countries joining forces with President Biden now. No doubt about it, Kira. This has been a coordinated effort from the U.S., from the EU, the U.K., other allies, including now Japan and Australia, announcing these sanctions, really targeting banks in Russia, financial the assets of, of oligarchs there. This is so far an attempt to try to get to some of the people close to President Putin without directly kind of getting into the broader impact on the Russian household, you know, this is the fifth largest bank, for example, is targeted. But we did just hear from State Department spokesman Ned Price that they could go for the bigger banks, too. And that could have some real trickle down effects, not just throughout the Russian economy, but to the rest of the global economy, too. We are watching very closely to see if this latest announcement from the U.S., from President Biden, that they're sanctioning the company behind Nord Stream 2, if that elicits any response from Putin, then we're going to get into this bit of a tit for tat, which means ultimately, it could mean that Russia pulls back some of its oil exports. That could mean higher prices here at the pump. This is really something that the U.S. is emphasizing. It was the first of what could be many steps to come. Okay, and Mary Alice, when could those additional steps come and what could that look like? Yeah, Carol, we heard Ned Price there reiterate the message we've heard from the other White House officials all day that as, if, if Putin were to advance troops in any way beyond uh, the Donbass region, that that would trigger more of a response. I think that they're also looking for clues from the Ukrainians. We're going to see whether the Ukrainian military starts to respond. They would basically be admitting at that point that they view Russia as uh, invading beyond uh, territory that they deem remotely acceptable that they're willing to bring the fight and that would obviously put increased pressure on the White House to uh, step up sanctions. You know, a few other uh, interesting headlines from the State Department briefing here really fast. I was struck that Ned Price was asked about the U.S. keeping uh, representatives and diplomats in Moscow at the embassy there and he made the point of saying essentially yes. At this point they still think it is better to have a means to send messages and communicate with the Russians than not. So no indications at this point that the U.S. would be pulling ambassadors out of Russia. And then last, he said that, of course, Ukraine would have the right to self-defense. You know, the last few days, we've seen Putin really do everything to put Ukraine, Ukraine's president, Ukraine's military in a box to provoke them. And so far, the Ukrainians have been really applauded by the international community for their restraint. But you heard Ned Price there say that, that the Ukrainians have the right to self-defense. So obviously, the U.S. is going to back them up if and when the military, the Ukrainian military, decides to respond. And Ian, while we have you there on the ground, these cyber attacks on Ukraine, uh, what more can you tell us uh, about those and, and the impact that they may be having? Yeah, I mean, this clearly isn't the first time there's been a gradual ramping up of these kinds of uh, attacks. I don't think this is what people are talking about when they're talking about a massive crippling cyber attack on infrastructure. Um, however, it's certainly targeted a number of key financial and government institutions and websites. They've been temporarily paralyzed. But you don't see any great impact out on the streets. But this campaign of intimidation, if you like, has been going on. I mean, the Ukrainian government immediately points the finger of blame at Russia. We, we can't say that categorically, but that clearly would be uh, the, the prime suspect in carrying out these kinds of attacks. Also, there have been a number of bomb warnings over the last few weeks, really, in the country. They've ramped up again just to try and unsettle people, to try and distill a sense of unease, a sense of fear, a sense of trepidation. And, and so it's part of this wider campaign of intimidation. But I don't think that's a big one. What, what people are expecting is that if there is a large-scale cyber attack, the lights will go out. People will lose data 
on their phone, there won't be any Wi-Fi, communications will pretty much be frozen uh, at least for a short period of time and it could well affect the delivery of electricity, water supplies, other key parts of the infrastructure that keeps a country running and could well control the command and control capability of the Ukrainian government and the Ukrainian military. That's what people are thinking about in a whole uh, large-scale kind of cyber attack. We haven't seen that, uh, and that's certainly what people are alert to in the coming hours and uh, days. Got it. And Phil, that Ukrainian plea in front of the UN today that we observed, what are they looking for from NATO countries at this point? Well, right off the bat, Kira, they asked the NATO countries to first not recognize the changes, obviously, made to the breakaway regions. That was the first thing they did. Then after that, they're asking for more sanctions. The European Union uh, today, heavy sanctions, 351 members of the Russian parliament that voted to ratify uh, Putin's decision to go into eastern Ukraine, sanctioned. Uh, Russian banks, sanctioned. Oligarchs, uh, sanctioned on the oligarchs, uh, sanctions on imports and partial exports to and from that region. Uh, that's what's happening. Then the U.S. joining Germany, uh, putting a pause on the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. That happened today as well. All of this is happening, but the question is, is all of this going to make a difference? Does Vladimir Putin take the sanctions, as he's been taking for years and years and years, and still go further into Ukraine? We're going to have to wait and see. And, Elizabeth, as we heard from Ned Price there at the State Department, uh, if indeed Russia would rage a war here, the human rights aspect of things, that's really the first time we've heard this in such detail when that was raised in the briefing. Yeah, this is something that U.S. officials are increasingly pointing to, that this would be a brutal, devastating, costly war, focusing on the refugees, focusing on how the Ukrainian people would be directly targeted as part of this assault and really trying to say this is why you watching at home should care about this. This is a breach of international norms. These actions that President Putin has taken violate international law. Decades of treaties that have really been in place since World War II and by sort of allowing this behavior from Putin, which of course the White House and allies are saying we don't allow it, it's going, it, it sets a dangerous precedent. Not Breaking only the status quo. Absolutely. It creates this, this new norm. It might have have more authoritarian governments say we can go forward with action like that and that is a dangerous road to go down and it's something we're hearing in the language from from uh, spokespeople but as well from the president now too elizabeth thank you ian thank you so much everyone uh, mary ellis as well hi everyone george stephanopoulos here thanks for checking out the abc news youtube channel if you'd like to get more videos show highlights and watch live event coverage click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel and don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching. Russia overnight launched its long anticipated attack on Ukraine, striking military posts across the country. An unprovoked war in Europe is now underway. The assault began with an angry message from President Vladimir Putin broadcast in the middle of the night. Russia cannot feel safe, develop and exist with a constant threat emanating from the territory of modern Ukraine, he said, describing the government in Kiev as a junta of neo-Nazis determined to build nuclear weapons. As Putin spoke, seemingly on cue, Russian bombs started falling. Crews and ballistic missiles, Ukrainian officials said, along with attack helicopters striking military installations, including air bases near the capital, Kiev and more military targets in several other Ukrainian cities, including Kharkiv, the biggest city in eastern Ukraine. Russia claimed to have eliminated much of Ukraine's defenses, but the Russian reports appear exaggerated. Several videos showed what Ukrainian officials described as columns of Russian tanks entering Ukrainian territory. A potentially devastating war in Ukraine has just begun. But so far it appears to be a gradual assault, Putin, who said he does not want to occupy the country, may be trying to take Ukraine without having to fight hard for it, appealing to the military not to resist. But there are no signs Ukrainians are raising the white flag. President Zelensky, in a pre-dawn appeal, told Ukrainians to stay strong and calm as he announced the start of martial law. While some Ukrainians in Kiev were heading out of the capital, many are determined to stay and resist. In Mariupol, people this morning were stocking up on cash with long lines at the ATMs. How are you feeling? 
I'm nervous, and I'm trying to keep my children calm, said Yulia. Putin says he's doing Ukrainians a favor by trying to get rid of their Nazi fascist government. What do you, what do you think about that? We don't need his protection, she said, and dismissed Putin's claims as lies. Supermarkets were flooded too. 45-minute waits for checkout. This is our Ukraine. I'm staying. I'm calm. I'm even smiling, said Ivan. Ukraine has mobilized its forces and begun to defend its cities. The government is calling for urgent blood donations to treat the growing but still unclear number of casualties. Putin, in his message that launched this military offensive, seemed to have a special message for the United States, reminding the world that Russia is a nuclear power and said that anyone that tried to stop Russia's actions would face terrible consequences. Hoda. Richard Engel for us there. Richard, thank you. Hey, thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Find your favorite recipes, celebrity interviews, uplifting stories, shop our favorite deals, and so much more with the Today app. Download it now. Good evening. The Russian invasion of Ukraine is rapidly spreading like a deadly stain over the country. An attack from the air with war jets and missiles seemingly aimed at the capital, Kiev. Tens of thousands of refugees are fleeing the fighting or, in the cities, sheltering in subways and cellars. Europe correspondent Karianne Greenbank is in the Ukraine capital and begins our coverage. Rest. Missiles rain down on Kiev. Samolot, Ukraine's capital under fire in a pre-dawn Russian assault. A nine-storey unit block up in flames. Three people believed to have been injured after Ukraine's military downed a Russian aircraft. Hours earlier, blasts in the city seen before they're heard. An airstrike offensive signalling full-scale war. This was an airbase in the country's southeast, while flames and what sounds like gunfire reverberates around the city of Sumy in the north. Ukrainians with no choice but to watch from their windows as the attack came from all sides. Coming too close to those trying to stay safe in their homes. Thousands scrambled underground. Families packing metro stations along with prams and pets. We are totally not the same as Russians and we don't want to be a part of Russia or any other country. It's really getting very emotional. And I cannot believe it's happening, really. And I just hope that uh, some people in Russia may see this and just step against and Newborn babies moved from intensive care to a makeshift bomb shelter beneath a children's hospital in eastern Ukraine. <laughs> Some stayed to survey the damage, managing to survive the deadly blasts. In the northeastern city of Kharkiv, bloodied blankets were left behind in homes with their walls blown out. For those who have fled, it was the most heartbreaking of goodbyes. <laughs> this father overcome while farewelling his family. <laughs> it's estimated more than 100,000 people have headed to the borders. It was um, unexpected and uh, we all want peace and um, quiet. We don't want uh, war. Please like, stop because um, people suffer from it. Seeking refuge in Poland? We definitely will need world's help. And we definitely need to make sure we are all together against this. As well as Romania and Hungary. Oh my God, call my mom. Hey, where are you? you we're, 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 going, we're going to Germany. 
In a late night national address, Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky claiming Russia's plan is to kill him, saying the enemy has marked me as target number one, my family as target number two. And desperately calling on NATO for urgent membership, I have asked directly, he says, everyone is afraid, no one answers. So it's 1.30 in the morning and we have just been warned that the centre of Kiev may be hit with airstrikes in the next couple of hours. So we're just relocating five floors down here to this bunker and uh, this is where we'll be sleeping tonight. Russian forces have taken control of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant and raised their flag over a hydroelectric site in the country's north. But Ukraine is fighting back. President Zelensky declaring martial law and pledging to arm every person willing to defend the country. This video shows a Russian pilot parachuting from his obliterated aircraft close to the capital. Ukraine's military saying it has destroyed Russian tanks and killed soldiers. But the true cost of this crisis is being felt by ordinary citizens. Kari Ann Greenbank joins us now from Kiev. And Kari, Russian troops are right now advancing towards the capital. Well, they are, Georgie. U.S. officials believe that Russian troops are now around 30 kilometres away from Kiev and advancing. The U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, is saying he is convinced Vladimir Putin is trying to force a change of government, getting rid of the current government and replacing it with a puppet regime. Now, President Zelensky has just said that he believes Russian special forces are already in Kiev trying to abduct him and seize power. He is refusing to leave the capital, but he well knows if he is captured, he could be killed. Georgie? Karian Greenbank in Kiev, thank you. It's not just international leaders condemning Russia's attacks on Ukraine. Around the world, there's been a groundswell of protest. And if it usually appears Vladimir Putin has suppressed dissent in his own country, courageous Russians are out on the streets, angered by the invasion. In Vladimir Putin's hometown, St. Petersburg, yeah, the president's yeah. own people yeah. led the protest. The chance of no more war, the soundtrack to an uprising, taking place in more than 40 Russian cities. We believe that conflict must be resolved peacefully, without violence from any side. Russian police arresting almost 2,000 anti-war demonstrators as Putin's regime tried to quell dissenting voices. Some clashes turned violent. Arrest Putin, not me, says this protester. This elderly woman detained for a simple sign stating no war. In Tel Aviv, a Russian citizen burns her passport as rallies around the world waved the blue and yellow bands of Ukraine from London to Tokyo, Finland, Times Square, today I think everybody's Ukrainian, and outside the White House. While inside the East Room, Putin is the aggressor. Putin chose this war. And now he and his country will bear the consequences. The US president unveiled sanctions hoping to cripple the foundations of Russia's economy, including cutting off more of Russia's biggest banks, freezing assets and limiting the ability to deal in dollars, pounds, euros and yen. President Biden said he had no plans to talk to Vladimir Putin and that NATO is now more united and determined than ever. On the tier? Germany's chancellor wanting Russian leadership to pay a high price for their aggression. These are among the darkest hours for Europe since the end of World War II. He will never be able to cleanse the blood of Ukraine from his hands. And although the UK and our allies tried every avenue for diplomacy until the final hour, I'm driven to conclude that Putin was always determined to attack his neighbour, no matter what we did. The United Kingdom sanctioning more than 100 Russian individuals and their entities and calling to end Russia's use of SWIFT international payment systems. The Pentagon announcing the deployment of 7,000 more troops in the coming days, not for combat, but to bolster NATO forces, with fears Putin may have eyes on another prize. He has much larger ambitions in Ukraine. He wants to, in fact, re-establish the former Soviet Union. As his tanks rolled out in Ukraine, Putin hosted Imran Khan, the first Pakistani prime minister to visit Moscow in a quarter of a century. 
the world watching the response from the West closely, China nursing its own territorial ambitions. Are you urging China to help isolate Russia? I'm not prepared to comment on that at the moment. Beijing has ordered the evacuation of the Chinese embassy in Kiev and urged Chinese citizens still in Ukraine to fly a Chinese flag to protect themselves. China has so far refused to call it an invasion. While Russian state TV claims Ukrainians are happy to be liberated by Russian troops. But on the streets, thousands of Russians bravely and defiantly disagree. U.S. correspondent Alison Petrowski is in Washington, D.C. And Alison, will these new sanctions have the intended effect? Well, look, Georgie, uh, 48 hours ago we saw the first wave of sanctions roll out and they didn't appear to be a deterrent to Vladimir Putin at all. If anything, Georgie, it seemed to spur him on and speed up the invasion into Ukraine. President Biden today calling for patience, saying it's going to take time before we see these new wave of measures have an impact on the Russian people and the Russian economy. But also today, Georgie, President Biden said that if uh, Vladimir Putin isn't stopped, he may become emboldened and move on to other countries. Alison Petrowski, thank you. The Russian assault on Ukraine has been swift, brutal and comprehensive. Nine's Lizzie Pearl joins us in the studio. Lizzie, what's been targeted so far? Georgie, the situation on the ground is fast moving, but this is what we know about the Russian offensive so far. Russia has attacked Ukraine from the air, sea and land, from the east, the south and the north. It began with an aerial bombardment right across the country. Cruise missiles were reported hitting major cities, including Kiev, as well as military sites and key pieces of infrastructure. In the east, Russian-backed separatists began advancing on Donetsk and Luhansk. To the north, Russian troops have moved on the second city of Kharkiv, with intense fighting reported there. Russian forces also invaded from Belarus, capturing the Chernobyl power plant. That's the site of the world's worst nuclear nuclear disaster. It's reported they are now pushing towards Kiev with Russian paratroopers landing at a strategic airfield on the outskirts of the capital and there's been heavy fighting there with Ukrainian special forces. In the south, Russian troops invaded from Crimea while the key port of Odessa was shelled heavily before Russian amphibious commandos came ashore from boats. It's been a lightning assault in the first 24 hours. Georgie. Indeed, Lizzie, thank you. Let's now go to our Europe correspondent, Brett McLeod, who is at Downing Street in London. And Brett, this is a European invasion of a type we haven't seen since World War II. What is the next step for EU leaders? Yes, Georgia, London certainly knows what it's like to come under aerial attack from a hostile European neighbour. Many thought that had been left behind in the 20th century, though. Boris Johnson will be joining other NATO leaders in a meeting, but that's not happening for a few more hours yet, by which time it could come far too late for any assistance for Kiev. A lot of Baltic states, former Soviet satellites, now part of NATO, very concerned about where Vladimir Putin's guns could be trained next after Ukraine. Georgia. OK, Brett McLeod, thank you. Now to Canberra and Nine's political editor Chris Yulman. Chris, there are concerns this war could have repercussions much closer to home. Yes, Georgie. Today the Prime Minister lashed out at China for easing trade restrictions against Russia as the West imposes sanctions for its unprovoked attack on Ukraine. The Defence Minister also joined the assault, saying Moscow and Beijing had formed an unholy alliance, and he called on the Chinese president to use his influence to end the war. It's a sign that the government believes a recent pact forged between Russia and China poses a long-term threat to our region. Australia's political leaders are united in demanding the world exact a toll on Russia for waging war against Ukraine. There must be a cost, there must be a price, and it must be imposed by the global community. It's important that the entire world act against this aggression. Sanctions will be extended beyond Russian banks and officials to its neighbour and ally Belarus, and the Prime Minister wants all sporting links severed. The F1 should not be held. It should not be held in Russia. While the target is Moscow, Beijing is also in Canberra's sights for refusing to condemn the invasion. There's one leader in the world, frankly, who can exert pressure on President Putin, and that is President Xi. And China has lifted restrictions on Russian wheat imports as the West imposes bans. You don't go and throw a lifeline to Russia in the middle 
of a period when they're invading another country. Vladimir Putin met Xi Jinping during the Winter Olympics, where the two deepened their bonds in a landmark joint statement that said the friendship between the two states has no limits. China and Russia have entered into this, frankly, unholy alliance. The Prime Minister has dubbed the axis between Moscow and Beijing a coalition of autocracies that threatens the world. I've been warning about this for years. Yesterday, the new Chinese ambassador offered an olive branch to mend the fractured relationship. China is willing to work with Australia to meet each other halfway. Last year, the Chinese embassy handed Nine News a list of 14 grievances against Australia. Among them are demands that Australian MPs and its media stop criticising Beijing. The Prime Minister says he's not going to bargain away Australia's freedom. In terms of meeting halfway, there are 14 points. I don't agree with changing any of them. There's a hot war in Ukraine and a new cold war is spreading across the globe. Chris Ullman, Nine News. Hundreds of Ukrainian nationals have gathered across Sydney today in a sign of solidarity for their friends and family back home. Many shared stories of helplessness, watching from afar as relatives shared videos of bombings and evacuations. 15,000 kilometres away, Martin Place awash with patriotism and pain. Our house got bombed. We don't have a house anymore. We don't have a home anymore. And we can't do anything about it. Anna Baladin's uncle is on the front line. He's walking around the streets and there's just dead bodies on the floor. There's a helplessness watching from Sydney as their families come under attack. Anton Boganovich organised the rally to put pressure on the government as explosions ripped through the Kiev street where he grew up. My parents woke up in the middle of the night from the sounds of explosions. One of such missiles landed in the backyard of my brother's house. Making her way through the crowd, a lone Russian in a red dress. I'm against Putin and I'm against his regime. I'm supporting Ukraine with all of my heart. At St Andrew's Church in Lidcombe, tears and grief for a homeland at war. O oh Lord great and almighty, protect our beloved Ukraine. The Ukrainian community united in their fear. Please help us, help us. We can't, we can't do uh, this uh, uh, Russian army only alone. And their defiance. Ukraine doesn't want a war. It's Putin who wants war. Andrew Manzinski's late father fled the Red Army as a little boy in 1945. Yesterday, his niece, Pixie Schmigel, did the same. The airlines were closed down, communications disappeared. Pixie somehow managed to grab a car and drove all the way to Poland overnight. She was one of the lucky ones who managed to get out, but many have relatives now trapped. Many of the people here today have built a life in Australia because of conflict and now they're watching it unfold again. What they desperately want is more help from the Australian government to bring their loved ones, still stuck in Ukraine, here to safety. I brought my grandparents here two months ago and my one question is, can we please get them a visa? Can we please keep them here? I can't send them back. Sophie Walsh, Nine News.